You're listening to All In. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you fulfill the mission of God in your life and around the world. I'm your host, Jeff Wood. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of All In. Today it's my privilege to have as our guest Dr. Sam Rockwell. Sam is a longtime friend of mine who's actually worked with me in a number of contexts in global missions. Uh, he and I have traveled in Russia on a, uh, several occasions and Ukraine and I've had the privilege of being with him in his field of ministry. Uh, Sam is the supervisor for the Gateway District of Foursquare Churches in the United States. Sam, welcome to the podcast. Hey Jeff, it's always a pleasure to hang out with you. It's always a joy. Hey, tell us a little bit, what in the world does it mean to be a district supervisor? <laughs> oh gosh. Do you know? Well, you know we have we have six states now, Colorado, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, Missouri, and Wyoming. Is that six? And, and you don't uh, do math on the air. That's always a dangerous yeah, thing. Th- this is what I'll say. Um the supervisor job has traditionally been kind of an iconic uh, position in Foursquare. Supervisors are sort of expected to be everywhere, make you know major decisions about appointments, uh, intervene in crises. Uh, you know, we're real estate agents, we're lawyers, we're therapists, and I think the the good thing about what is changing about that is we're kind of um, dispersing those responsibilities throughout our district. In our district, we have really strong teams in the areas of pastoral care, leadership development, and then church multiplication, as well as a real strong uh, administrative um, ministry. Uh, And so I I guess what I'm saying is I feel a lot more free Mm -hmm. to do mission and leadership development, which I think is the ideal um, kind of power alley for a district supervisor to be in. So so that's it. Okay. Now how many churches are are in these six states? We have 122 um, like official churches. We have about 25 churches that don't have official uh, EIN numbers. Okay. In other words, they're not officially now, for, for churches. For the people out there wondering what this government EIN is, Employment Identification Number, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, something like that. It, it, it means it's officially uh, has its own tax number and all that kind of thing. And we have about 122, but we're giving our, our you know, missional churches, churches in process, we're taking a longer time to make them official because we want them to be in kind of an experimental state for a longer period of time. Many of these churches will um, become pretty, I don't know what the right word is, not traditional necessarily because many of them are very contemporary in style, but traditional in structure uh, eventually. But we don't want to hurry that process. You know, we're reaching new cultures. Here in Denver, we're reaching Southeast Asians. Our Hispanic churches are multiplying uh, at a fast rate, and we have different cultures and different kind of affinity groups that we're um, meeting. So we want to create kind of a dynamic buffer for them so that they can continue to develop and not be, you know, squished into the little, you know, this is how you have church molds. So the short answer to that is we have 22 churches, but about another 25 churches of in process, in training, and at the same time figuring out, you know, who they are. Okay, great, good. Now, <clears throat> in addition to being a district supervisor of a, of a large swath of the United States, you are also a published author. You've got a book out called uh, Leading by Being and Doing. You're the adjunct professor at Pepperdine University, Life Pacific College, and King's University. You're kind of a busy guy, it seems like. And, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I am busy. Yeah, but, and then uh, you, you get to travel very, a bit. Uh, yeah, well, I get to travel with you every once in a while, and that's that's uh, 
a terrible burden in my life, but it's something that I, I try to... Careful, careful. I do, I do for the sake of the gospel. Yeah, I am busy, but I, I think I, I have an integrated life, and it all fits into to my call. And uh, so I'm very, very fortunate that I get to do the things I love, and my family supports that, and often, um, you know, D uh, goes with me, my wife. And so, yeah, I'm busy, but, hey, I take time to go skiing and have fun. Yeah, that's good. That's one of the things I've actually always enjoyed about working with you is, though you're an accomplished person, you're not one of those that, uh, you know, you can't be around because you just don't know how to relax. You and I enjoy being together. We'd like, you know, we, I remember that time we were together in St. Petersburg and just go walking around, hey, let's go check out that place or let's go check out oh, this place. And, what a great walking city St. Petersburg yeah. is. And I love walking cities, yeah. you know, like Budapest and Prague. All those beautiful places where you get to go to more than I do. Yeah, it's it's a rough life. Somebody's got to do it, though. Now you're uh, you have a PhD in human and organizational systems. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I never um, I never intended to get a PhD. It's kind of a long story, but I. I got a master's of science degree in organizational development because as a pastor, I realized that I was not trained or prepared in any way, shape, or form to manage a, a growing congregation. You know, I, basically, you know, I'm not, it's not this way as much, but, you know, when I was going to Bible college, basically, you were taught kind of how to preach and how to do, <laughs> you know, marriage ceremonies and funerals and how to do, like, biblical counseling, kind of yeah. they're like little micro skills, but you were never really taught, you know, how to manage or develop an organization. And a church is more than an organization, but it is an organization. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to kind of integrate everything that I've learned by being in a program. So I got a, a Master of Science degree in organizational development. And then through a, another series of... Uh, um, <laughs> stumblings along the way. I ended up getting a master's degree in human development because I I love learning, mm -hmm. and that's what that was about. I I love you know what does it mean to be a person who's committed to self development over a lifetime, and then that led me to people uh, and instructors, professors who talked me into going into a Ph.D. program that really combined those. And uh, it was just another six years of school, <laughs> and I translated that into a Ph.D. in human and organizational systems. Okay. So, yes, that's the long, sad story of that. Yeah, it sounds painful. <laughs> it sounds torturous. And I, and I cover all fun. I cover all of this, uh, the, you know, for lack of a better word, the pedigree, not, not to, you know, just to shine the brass on your, on your lapel, as it were, but, to, oh, you know, to say, hey, there, here's, here are some qualifications. They're not all of the qualifications, but at least for the folks out there who don't know you, to at least know that you, you've got the goods. You know, not only academically, but you do it experientially. You've been a successful pastor. You're a successful uh district supervisor you're fully engaged in global missions uh traveling you just got back from uh, a country in in asia i don't even know if it's a public place that we can even talk about we didn't talk about that offline if, if we could even mention any of that but you're involved in <clears throat> you're you are involved in the stuff so i want people to get a taste of it as we as we get into some of these questions now here on as a supervisor and I'm going to just kind of peel through the various layers of your life and get a picture here. Uh, as, as a supervisor, you, you have your job description, of course. You know, you, you rattled it off a little bit. And, and, and you and I have talked about this before privately, some of these things that uh, you didn't. That, that's not what was in your heart when Jesus called you to the ministry, of course. You know, you didn't want to be the property manager or anything like that. But. What, beyond the, the official job description, what do you feel 
And what do you believe is your assignment from the Lord for the district that you're serving right now? Well, it's taken us a few years, but I think the assignment that um, I embrace is pretty well reflected by the organization that um, that we've created here, um, along with all the, the great team members and the pastors here in this district. In other words, I think the organization aligns with my call, but more importantly, it aligns with what our pastors believe are the most important things um, that our district should be doing. Mm -hmm. So for me, that has to do with pastoral care, leadership development, and church multiplication, um, church planting, discipleship making, and extending uh, the borders uh, of of God's kingdom in the world. And for me, and I know this is a, you know this is your where you live. To me, that in that very much involves you know missions. Yeah. Um, there is there needs to be anyway less and less. Um, distinction between missions here in the United States, the ethnicities, the cultures that we need to reach, and missions around the world. Now, those are distinct, and they are not e exactly the same thing. I'm not saying that, mm -hmm. but we have to partner together uh, in doing mission. Uh, like never before, because we need to learn from one another yeah. about how to reach people who are not being reached, especially unreached people groups around the world. Yeah, yeah that's great. Now, as a, as a supervisor, you are a leader of leaders, and part of what you have to do is a point uh, within our Foursquare system. People, some people may not know this listening to the, to the podcast, but within the Foursquare system, ecclesiology, in the, at least in the United States, the district supervisor is the bishop who appoints pastors to local churches. And so when you're going through that whole process of assessing a, a, a potential uh, appointment or maybe a church planter, what are, the, what are the markers that you are looking for or the, the leading indicators as opposed to the not necessarily the lag indicators, you know, that show what they've done, but the leading indicators that show where they're going. What are the things that you look at? What are those markers that you would look for in a, in a leader? Well, first of all, the, the appointment process, I think, uh, in our district has become much more collaborative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just me, you know, uh, going to my prayer tower and getting a name and then, you know, um, declaring an edict about who's going to be a yeah, pastor. Right. It, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, it, it might. I might just decide, you know, who's going to be the pastor, but I, I rarely do that. Can't think of the last time I did. Uh -huh. uh, we have an assessment interview um, to try to determine where a leader is coming from based on what, you know, they've done, mm -hmm. because that's important. That's right. the best indicator of what they will do. And we also assess more than ever, I think, the local culture and the congregation. Uh, we do a church health assessment um, tool to kind of uh, determine where the congregation is mm -hmm. vis-a-vis the, the, the background of the pastor and so on and so forth. But these are the things that, that I look for, just to answer your question. I mean, the things that, that I'm looking for in a pastor and that is, do they have the capacity to create community? Do they know how to bring people together and create a sense of camaraderie and esprit de corps to get people to move together in the right direction? If they don't have that, they're not a leader. Secondly, can, do they have the ability to um, exegete, if you will, their, the, the culture they find themselves in, not just the church culture, but the surrounding neighborhood and um, town or suburb or rural community or urban metropolitan environment. That's a pretty big deal, and uh, we can talk about that later when we talk about missions because I think they're very closely correlated. Right. 
Um, so th- those are really big things to me, and it's it's more and more difficult to find people who will really plant themselves in um, a community and stay there and live there, whether it's a metropolitan area, whether it's a suburb, whether it's a rural um, area. Uh, it's you know you can get you know great, interesting, accomplished people to go to places. But part of the discernment process is can they stay there and can they make that transition to really embrace? It's really an incarnational value. Can you, you know, like Jesus, <laughs> sort of, you know, leave your ideal environment and really take on the, you know, put on the clothing of the local, the local garb and, and be an incarnational instrument where you are? That's... That's the short answer, I guess, to try to... It's really a spiritual discernment process to appoint a pastor in a church. Yeah. Well, and I like what you're saying there about exegeting the culture, because that is basic missiology. And knowing a little bit about your district, you have uh, the extremes on... Yeah. You, you know, you've got the People's Republic of Boulder which is to the left, <laughs> political left of San Francisco. <laughs> and then you've got <clears throat> all the way over to Marlboro Man, conservative, uh, mm-hmm. salt of the earth kind of places, and everything in between. I can only imagine when you're having a pastor's meeting the kind of discussions that can come up from that. Yes. So you've got to have a great <laughs> flexibility. Right. You're right. There's a lot of diversity in our district, and that's why we have to... Make sure that we're always focusing on what is appropriate for the culture. And it's also one of the reasons why I'm really a proponent, Jeff, of getting people on the mission field. Mm-hmm. Because uh, I, I experienced this as a pastor, and uh, we all have to be able to, you know, quote, exegete our culture. And we're all products of our culture, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we're, we're stuck with that. God made us to be creatures of, of culture. But the problem is when, we, is when we don't have any awareness of that, you know, right. that our own perspective is invisible to us. And that's, that's what we try to talk to pastors about. It's, we're not asking them to divest themselves you know, of their Kansas perspective or their roots or their, you know, Denver, um, you know, sensibility. You know, no one's asking a Bronco fan to be a Kansas City fan. You know, it's just not reasonable to, to ask anyone to do there that. There's some things you just can't do. <laughs> those, are, those are barriers that are just too high. But what we can do, in a, and, and it becomes easier to do, is to recognize our own culture for what it is. Mm-hmm. It's culture. And I don't know a better way to do that than to get people out of their culture. And once people have culture shock, then they can begin to have cultural awareness. And for pastors and leaders to not have a out of culture experience, mm-hmm. to put it that way, yeah, I just think they really have a limited perspective, and and I think that is will really hamper their ability to be in their own culture and see it for what it is and to see the nuances of culture within their local culture because these days, as you know, it doesn't matter where you're from. I don't care if you're from a rural town in Kansas or from a metropolitan area. Uh, nowadays, you have micro-cultures yeah. everywhere. Yeah. And they're often hidden from us, and we don't see them, even though they, you know, evidence themselves right across the street. We don't see them because we don't have eyes trained to see culturally. So that's a bit of a hobby horse of mine. And, but that's why I go on the. That's why I went. One of the reasons why I went on the mission field was selfishly for my own benefit, mm-hmm. and it's one of the reasons selfishly why. I want our pastors to be involved in missions. Uh, I do believe there's benefit for, you know, those folks who receive our ministry. There's some benefit for them. 
hopefully, mm -hmm. but it really it's really beneficial for the local leader to be in a global context. Yeah, I agree. You know, one of the <clears throat> if you're wanting to understand water, the probably the last person you should ask about water is a fish because that's the only context they've ever known. <laughs> and <clears throat> right. know that the, I mean, if you go talking to fish, you've got some serious problems and you do need a professional <laughs> counselor, but you get the story. I think it's great when we can get uh, pastors like yourself. It's how and it's how I got involved uh, doing missions work. It was a, I was a local pastor, and I knew that God had called me to something bigger than what was in front of me. You know, you know not only my local congregation that I was shepherding, but the city. You know, to, to have that parish mentality that I was called to the city, not to that local congregation, as well as called to be a partner in God's global mission. You know, that he has this radical agenda that he wants to upright this world that's fallen over. And that every yeah. single church, every local church, is supposed to be fully engaged in global mission. Yeah. You know, you yeah. have one of your churches in your district is a, is a great partner of ours. Uh, it's the Parsons Foursquare Church. And, you know, they're... Yeah. Great example. <clears throat> you know, they are an interesting group. They are... A geographical anomaly. There are two and a half hours from everywhere. Yeah, you know, you from any airport you fly into, you got to drive yep. to at least two and a half hours to get there. Yep. And, uh, mm -hmm. I love that church. I've got friends there. I'm honored to go there whenever the pastor, whenever Pastor Steve invites me to come out, and you know, about once a year I get to go out there. And here he is in Parsons, Kansas. It's a city of about I think about ten thousand people. Yep, mm -hmm. and you know. But they are passionate about global missions. You know, they are just as passionate as Randy Remington out in uh, Portland, Oregon, or yes. uh, any of the any of the people yeah. that you, that might come to come to mind when you're thinking about you know churches in the U.S. who are, have have a big missions impact. Well, I can tell you, you know, Parsons and all of these, you know, Kenny that you know you brought Kenny to to Russia, you know, and, and his impact there when we were together. Just all of these guys. It's transformational in the life of that local church to be involved in the global harvest. Yeah, and, and it takes us out of all the little cultural, uh, what I would say, what I would call superficial, superficial cultural conversations that the church is so obsessed with sometimes. You know, I don't know if you're on Facebook. I know you are. Yeah, on Facebook. Uh, but I mean, we... We we sometimes can't discern the difference between the gospel and American cultural Christianity, right? Because we're so myopic, and because we don't get out of our country, and because we think that the issues that we think are so important here in the United States define uh, the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. and this is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> But you show me a pastor who will go to to Asia and spend a week or two. You show me a pastor who go to Ukraine, who go to Russia, who go wherever, really, and spend some time and get to know those people, really get to know those people and understand where they're at. First of all, that leader will have to confront her own culture. Right. They'll have to think about it in new terms. And when they go back, they will see just how you know, narrow-minded we become about what constitutes um, a holy life. Yeah, exactly. And, and these things are really important. And, and if we as pastors are narrow in our thinking, if we don't know how to distinguish between culture and the and the essence of the gospel, uh, we are going to hit all kinds of ceilings in our effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So you as a supervisor strongly encourage your pastors to get get dirty when it comes to global missions. Yeah. Good. Yeah, Good. not always successful. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's really, it's, it's what I said before. It's if you've never experienced cultural shock, you probably haven't experienced much 
cultural awareness. Yeah. And two, I would say, you know, it's it's kind of like um, it's kind of like not harvesting the corners of your field. Yeah. You know, a pastor should be giving ten percent of his or her time to missions. I, I don't mean giving money. I do mean that. I I don't mean just prayer. I do mean that. I mean going. Yeah. I mean being, being there because the fact is, and, and, and maybe this sounds patronizing to some, but my experience, and I have been all over the world, is that I'm not sure that all, everything that we have to share as Americans is, is really that valuable. Mm -hmm. But my experience is that when we go to places, um, we bring encouragement and a, a sense of validity to many, many people around the world and right. we encourage them and, and it's valuable. Yeah. And that's a very humbling thing to say. I, I don't even get that. I don't know why. Yeah. But, but I think as Americans, we, we do tend to be leaders uh, in the world. That's controversial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that's a mixed bag. Yeah. And when we export our culture, I think that's usually not good. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of all the problems mm -hmm. with that, but I think that we do, we can really do some good uh, around the world and that we have something to bring. Yeah. But again, I always come back to the fact that it probably does uh, the American traveler more good than perhaps what we are actually able to accomplish on the field. And that's probably very, very accurate. Uh, you know, I've noticed it as well both personally when I was traveling as a, as a local pastor and now on this, this side of the missions equation, that the benefit so much of the time on, on the field, on the mission field, is that sense of connection. You know, mm -hmm. here, uh, family matters. And uh, you and I are members of the same tribe. You know, so we work within, <clears throat> not exclusively, of course, within the Four Square tribe, but... That's our tribe. And that's a very valuable thing to people in the field. Now, I know in America, yes. here's, here's, a cult, here's a perfect example of cultural differences. In America, we think it's a sign of kingdom maturity to say, you know, names don't matter, our denomination doesn't matter, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're just, and so we really downplay it. Now, we, of course, we don't want to be denominational in the sense of, hey, we're better than everybody else. But we kind of downplay the family tribe, as it were. Whereas outside of the U.S., they don't. You know, that it's, no. it's valuable to them. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you are going somewhere around the world to minister as a minister of the, of the gospel, and you go into a country where they have uh, four square churches, they don't want to control you, but they'd like to meet you. They'd like to say, hey, come on over. Yeah, go do whatever you're doing and come over here and have coffee with us. Come say hi. We want to know you. Those right. relationships are very valuable here on the field. Yeah, that is absolutely true. And, and I think one of the reasons for that is because uh, in many places around the world, there, there are structures, there are systems, um, their practices are often less developed. And they need that help. Yeah. I mean, we take that for granted because we're, um, sometimes we've transcended the denominational uh, resources or structures in some ways, and that's something we have to grapple with. But to think that that's the case or all around the world is to really miss a huge opportunity. And um, that's one of the things that we have to offer, that mm -hmm. we can offer the less developed churches around the world, um, our support and uh, some of the things we've learned. Always being careful, though, not to superimpose American cultural Christianity right. on what they're doing, because that's, that's always a mistake. It's a mistake to do that here in our own country, which is a whole other topic. Yeah. And I, I hope that we can do better at, at, um, at discerning culture here in the United States as well. Yeah. That's good. I want to take another turn here and start un uh, unpacking a different subject now. Uh, in your ministry, and in both in your education and in your ministry, you talk a lot about personal health and uh, healthy systems. Uh, I want to 
pursue that a little bit. Let's unpack that. What does what is it you're hoping to accomplish when you are going into a context? Say, like when we've gone in, when we you've gone into Ukraine or into Russia or some of these places, and you talk about developing either a healthy system for yourself as a person or a healthy uh, family system or whatever the terminology you'd want to use. What what is it you're you're seeing and wanting to really see as an outcome of that? Well, first I'll talk about the system in, uh, as um, as something to pay attention to um, from the leader's perspective. Does that, does that sound mm-hmm. like what you want yeah. to talk about? Yeah. So, so for instance, um, you know, often we count, uh, you know, people who attend or uh, the money that we receive in offerings, okay? Mm-hmm. You know, that's sort of the bane of pastor's existence, you know, in a, in a denominational structure. They have to count things and that right. sort of thing. You know, you know, how many people attended, what's your offering, you know, that sort of thing. Or it's just simply what are the goals that you um, want to achieve. Goals are important. Numbers are important. But what I try to emphasize is there's a difference between goals and systems. You know, if if you're you know if you're the coach of the Denver Broncos, you know, let's just take a profound example to begin with. If you're the coach Go of the Denver Broncos, <laughs> the goal is to win a Super Bowl. That's the goal. The system is you know your offense, your defense your special teams, and their routine of practice, and all of the little details involved in making sure that you have a discipline and a process for everything that you do so that you, that you can become a better and better team. And, and what I see that needs developing, whether it's a local church in Colorado or you know Wyoming or, or Missouri, or whether it's the emerging church in Ukraine, is the emphasis on let's create systems that give us the results that we want. And in short, that to me, that means how, how are we creating disciples mm-hmm. from the very beginning? You know, how are people coming to know Christ? How are they being introduced uh, to the gospel? And in every culture, that's different because some have no um, idea, mm-hmm. you know, what the gospel is, and others have a more developed understanding. So that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. So, but to address that process from the very beginning of engagement all the way to being a fully mature um, disciple leader. Um, in God's king okay. and nurtured from beginning to end. And sometimes that's just a personal pastoral journey that you take with somebody. Mm-hmm. But if you have a growing congregation or a movement, that is a very complex, systematic, organizational project that has to be um, cared for and one must pay attention to that from beginning to end. So that's what I mean by a system. Okay. It's just a process that has a goal from beginning to end. It's, and we need to spend more time with systems and not just the goal. Yeah, everybody wants to win the Super Bowl. Right. But the, the question is, what are the disciplines and the rhythms and the practices of the church where it is. Is there a good resource that you would recommend for somebody out there that's wanting to explore this a little bit further? Well, one of the real simple ways of looking at this is the church by, is a book by um, Tom Lanier, and he wrote the book a number of years ago called Simple Church. Uh, now, that word has been kind of misapplied um, quite a bit. Now, when people say simple church, they often mean a a small church Mm -hmm. or even a house church or a cell type church. But that's not actually what he meant in that book. What he was trying to say in the book 
was simplify your processes and programs so that they align with a few simple things that you've decided to do as a congregation. Okay. And so what he's saying in the book is he's saying whatever you're trying to accomplish, create systems and programs that help people uh, proceed from beginning to end. Okay. And and do away with all of the extraneous things that you're doing, really distracting from uh, what you intend to do. It's a very simple idea, but it's it's kind of a um, it's a very simple process model of of doing things. Okay, great. Now, <clears throat> tell me about the Gateway Collegium. The Gateway Collegium is. Um, our attempt as a district to engage, especially all of our licensed ministers, in their own self-development, and th that's a big that's a big idea for us. Uh, and we use the word self-development very intentionally because what we're trying to help ministers do is not so much give them more content, you know, more classes, more books to read, things that I think they ought to learn. Mm -hmm. Rather, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find out uh, from our ministers what are they called to do, where are they called to be, what has God called them to accomplish, and first of all, really grapple with those questions. Okay. I mean, that is a point of reflection that many of us don't take time to continue to go back to again and again. If you're not a self-reflected person, um, you're going to get buried in the trivial things of life. You have to push back and, and constantly think about the big questions. Who am I? What do I believe? What do I intend to do with who I am in okay. the world? And so those are things we need to grapple with. And then um, our goal is to try to meet those um, learners where they are and giving them a very simple little roadmap of um, how their self-development might unfold over a period of, say, a year or two or three. Okay. So is this, this is all uh, based online, right? Well, yes. We, it's, it's sort of, you know, we start with asking our ministers to be in regional trainings. Mm -hmm. In other words, we're asking them, first of all, be in community uh, with your learning. Because the fact is, you know, uh, this has been proven over and over again, and that is that we learn best in community and in social situations. Right. So as valuable as online learning is, and I believe in that very much, I do online classes, learned, I've learned that way, and I instruct that way. There also needs to be a social um, component of learning. Mm -hmm. And so what we try to encourage everybody to do is to be in a, a training event that goes on uh, every quarter in our district in three different locations, Missouri, Kansas, and Colorado. Okay. So the goal there is not just to learn content, although we have uh, recognized ex experts in different subjects that come in, uh, but it's also to... Um, experience learning in community and really I, I think it's changed the identity of our district significantly that being a part of the district now is about being a learner and about uh, continuing to grow as a student slash disciple um, um, along the way not just it's not just Oh, you pastor a church. Uh, oh, you're four square, and you have a license, and then you just you know live this isolated existence. Mm -hmm. I think that we've made significant strides in in changing that. So it starts with just being a part of that community, and then um, through online resources and through what we call a minister's learning path that we're helping every one of our licensed ministers do. Um, every single person tells us what they want to do, where they want to go, what God's called them to do, that sort of thing. And then what experiences they need, what kinds of people they need, mentors and coaches, 
and what kind of books and more formal kinds of training they need to get there. And uh, that is not the, the learning uh, or the uh, uh, the minister's learning path is, is not completely developed in our district, but everyone in our district will have one completed by um, next September. Okay. So September. Uh, 2015. So we're getting there. That's our goal. It's, it's been about a three-year journey so far, but we're making uh, headway. Good. Now, this is a common theme that I'm hearing from you both in, in this interview as well as in our discussion over the last few years. This balance between who we are, being healthy in who we are, and healthy in what we do. And so this is a good segue to move into the, the book that you've ha you have written called uh, Leading by Being and Doing. Give me a little snapshot of what that book is about, though I've read it, you know, for our, for our listeners. Let them know, give them a, a little blurb about what this is about. Well, the idea is that, first of all, you can't separate being and doing. I hear a lot of language that sort of tends toward one or the other as if I could, in, in some isolated way, um, become who I am and then do what I do. Or, on the other side, that I could some, the, the things that I do in the world are somehow not me. Have you ever heard people say that? Well, you know, I did this really stupid thing, but no, that wasn't me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it it really was. It I'm wasn't. sorry, but uh, <laughs> it really was you. <laughs> And you are what you do. Who got the idea that somehow you could um, divest yourself of your actions? That you could say, you know, I'm, I'm really a wonderful poor person. I just lie and steal uh, on the weekends. That's, but that's not me. <laughs> so, and, and so what, part of the idea of the book is that on one hand, we actualize who we are by what we do. Mm -hmm. And that's to good and to, to, to bad. And, and then the other side is that we, because we are beings created in the likeness of God, uh, and because we're being transformed by the Holy Spirit, we can, also, we can also push back and say, I am something different than my mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I am a person with a, a seed of greatness, if you will, mm -hmm. to use that sort of, you know, uh, overblown language we hear too much of, but it's true. It, it is true. It is because true. we're made in the image of God, and God does come to us and challenge us with who we might be and who he intended us to be, and that is something greater than just what I've done. And so the book kind of explores that tension between who I am and uh, I, stabilize, I stabilize who I am, who, what I do with a constant process of reflection and prayer and, and consideration of who God's made me to be ultimately. But at the same time, I, I embody that in, in the things that I do. That, right. that's, that's kind of the idea, okay. is to try to explore the tension between who I am, uh, my best self, you know, the Holy Spirit inspired mm -hmm. self, the pure image of God, and what I do, which isn't all bad right. by any means, but it's, 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 it's a process that has to be integrated. I, I can't think of myself differently in terms of what I do versus this idea I have in my head about who I am. I have to bring integration to those two things. Okay, great. And the book is available on Amazon.com. So Amazon.com. We go to Sam Rockwell Books. And by the way, all of the proceeds go to our church planning funds here at the district. I, I don't see that. What little money that brings in. Okay, I don't great. get that. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. So please buy the book. You don't have to read it. Just pay Just for pay it. Just pay for it. And you'll be uh, contributing to a good cause. That is true. And, then, and if you read the book, it'll even advance that same cause even further. 
And we'll include links in the show notes uh, for anyone who, who wants to uh, access that, or they can just go to Amazon.com and look it up, Leading by Being and Doing by Sam Rockwell. Well, Sam, every guest I ask this question. If I had a time machine and could transport you back to have a conversation with your 25-year-old self, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, man. 25. Okay, I'm going back, 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 back. This, hold on, it's going to take a little time. Yeah. Back, back. <laughs> yeah, that's a time machine, all right. Yeah. That's a turbocharged time Yes, machine. it's going to take a while. Uh, you know, I am very blessed in that um, for some reason at an early place in my life, I knew I wanted to do the kinds of things that I'm doing. Often as a pastor, I thought that I was not well matched with that job. As you know, Jeff, I'm really more of an introvert, mm -hmm. and I often felt really uncomfortable um, pastoring a church, and especially as it grew. It, it, it was really awkward for me at times to be in that position, but I am still very happy I, I did that. It, it gave me so many opportunities to... Uh, to do different things. Here, here's the thing that I would say to my 25-year-old self, and that is, um, don't be so anxious, and don't be so ambitious, and don't worry so much. It kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. Don't worry so much about the goals, and pay more attention to the rhythms and the practices and mastering a few things that are important to you. Really commit yourself to those daily disciplines of being a person who loves the Scripture, being someone who's in prayer, uh, building and cultivating uh, the most important relationships in your life, um, finding out as a leader what are the things that I need, to, the big picture things that I really need to be monitoring, not losing myself in the weeds, but not thinking as much about the goals and the outcomes more the practices and being a master of a few things. Um, I think I, I think that I diminished some of my early years by being too goal oriented okay. <laughs> and too anxious about you know things like my church you know growth and you know how much money we were bringing in and how many staff people I was. I hate to admit that, but it's true. Yeah. I, I would sit down with that person and say, you know, do what God's called you to do and quit worrying about the outcomes so much. Yeah, that would be good advice. Mm -hmm. That would be great advice. Well, Sam, it's been a joy to have you on the podcast today. If people want to reach out and connect with you, maybe they've got some questions they'd like to learn about some of the stuff you're doing, find out, because you've also, you've got, we didn't even get into your other stuff that you're involved in. Maybe I'll have to have you back on <clears throat> on a future episode and just keep unpacking some of this stuff. It's always rich. How how can people connect with you? What do you, what's the best way? Well, they can always be my friend, you know, I'm a Facebook guy, okay. Facebook, uh, Sam Rockwell. Uh, also, I have a little website that I just post papers and, um, uh, jazz songs that I love, and different blogs and things like that. It's www.rockwellandco.com. Uh, it's a little site that I set up years ago when I was doing some consulting. Also, Gateway Collegium, that's C-O-L-L-E-G-I-U-M dot com, gatewaycollegium.com. You can also... Uh, find the links uh, to those two websites on gatewayfoursquare.org. So between those three websites, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of blogs that we uh, write, and also my um, colleagues here in the district office, and also, you know, from uh, different universities that I'm associated with, um, and other leaders in Foursquare also write these. Uh, blog article. So, uh, gatewaycollegium.com is a place for that. Also, rockwellandco.com. Now, is that um, the and is spelled out on that, correct? All yes. Okay. Yep. We'll include Rockwell links to this. And the, we'll include links in the show notes as well. Well, Sam, yep. it's been a joy. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. Do you have any parting thoughts or words of advice? Nope. 
Nope. Nope. You share. Love you and your uh, whole family, and I really respect everything that you do, Jeff. I also really appreciate you doing things like this. Um, you are um, a missionary. You're a pastor, and you're also an educator and a mentor to a lot of people. I appreciate it a lot. Well, we're done now. Thanks for listening. This is Jeff Roper reminding you that the mission of God is too grand for mediocrity or average living. You were created for a purpose, and that purpose is found in the mission of God. It's your life. Now go live it.